All right, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to, you know what? I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna be going through scripture so fast, you can try to keep up um, with me. But how about you just go to John 3.16? Have you ever heard of that? You wanna say that with me? All right, you sound like a bunch of degenerates. Come on, let's do better than this. And you gotta say, when you say God, you gotta say God, right, Uncle Dave? You can't say God. He doesn't know who you're talking about, okay? So, for so love the world that he... Amen. Awesome. Do you know that uh, the modern church has rewritten that a little bit? Did you know that? I'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> yep, here we go again. <laughs> Mark 12, 10. The title of this message is, But They Hate Me. But they hate me. Mark 12, 10 says, Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builder rejected has now become the cornerstone. How many of you know Jesus was rejected? Matthew 8, 34 says, And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. They begged Jesus to hit the road. How many feel like parts of our nation are kind of begging Jesus to hit the road? Anybody feel that way sometimes? All right, good. Mark 6, 3, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph, Joseph and Judas and Simon are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Luke 4, verse 28. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath or anger. They rose up and they drove him out of the town. They brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so they could throw him down the cliff. Now, I assume Jesus encountered a lot more persecution than is recorded in the scriptures because, right, the scriptures don't record his every waking day and moment. But these are some of the highlights. Uh, the, when God inspired the scriptures to be written, he said, I want people to understand that he faced a great deal of rejection, a great deal of hatred, and a great deal of persecution. Not just on the cross, not just leading up to the cross, but his whole life, and especially his ministry. Luke 17, 25, first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Luke 23, 18, but they cried out together saying, away with this man and release us Barabbas. They said, we, we, give us the thief. You, you guys keep that guy. We're gonna, we want him to die. John 1, 11, it says, he came to his own. Those who were his own did not receive him. John 15, 18, I'm reading these scriptures because I have heard these scriptures be used so many times in the wrong context especially this next one, John 15. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So us as believers, when we get hate, we're like, well, they hated him, so they hate us. Okay, cool. They rejected him, they're gonna reject us. They persecuted him, told him to leave town. They persecute us and tell us to leave town. The problem I have with that mentality or that way of thinking is it seems to excuse or make room for there to be division between us and the rest of the world. And so instead of trying to figure out how we can reach people, how we can get past the rejection, get past the persecution, get past them running us out of town and realize that there is a world of people that desperately need to hear the good news, we oftentimes use that as an excuse to isolate and pull away from the very people that God put us on the earth to serve and love. Does that make sense? And the church can be, y'all looking at me like you're mad. <laughs> the church 
In general, we, the church, can become so focused on loving God that we forget some of the very commandments he gave us when it comes to how we interact with the rest of the world. And so we will isolate ourselves and say, you know what, I'm just going to pour my life out to God and they rejected me and they hate me because I'm different and I think different and I act different and I live my life differently than they do and basically give up. And what has happened, church, and I want to be real with you, especially right now what's happening in the earth, that we are choosing, we are choosing a, a political affiliation over actually positioning ourselves that on November 4th, we're going to have to face people that voted differently than us, and they're just as valuable to the kingdom of God as somebody who voted like you and me. And so we're actually positioning ourselves to actually be alienated from half of the country. If you vote blue, half of the country you're alienated from. If you vote red, half of the country you're alienated from. And we're saying, well, if somebody who thinks different than me rejects me, they rejected Jesus too. So I'm good with it. I'm not good with it. I'm not good with it. I'm not good with, people have asked me a hundred times, probably 10 times a week on social media, I either get a message or a comment that says, Pastor Dan, who are you voting for? And I refuse to take the bait. Let me tell you why. I'm thinking post-November 3rd. I'm thinking I don't want to position myself to alienate groups of people that I might have an opportunity to share the ultimate good news, which is not who gets elected. The good news is Jesus. The good news, come on, you can feel whatever way you want. The good news is Jesus, and there's a kingdom greater than any kingdom of this world. So I believe that we've rewritten John 3.16, and it sounds like this, and it's not biblical. I believe that we've said, instead of for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, instead of that, I believe, you ready for this? You're going to want to write this down. You're going to want to tweet it. You're going to send it to your ex. You're going to want to... For we so loved God that we alienated the world. How many times have we positioned ourselves, and when I mean we, I mean we, as the church, where we have used loving God as an excuse to alienate the world? Here is the major issue with that. They are his children too. Do you hear me? They are his children too. So when I use a scripture or I use my engagement with God as an excuse to alienate myself from one of my siblings, see how silly that is. One of any father or mother is one of their greatest desires in life is that their children would grow to love one another. And I will take it a step further. If God was a father, and we know that he is, I have a 13-year-old daughter. One day, she'll meet somebody. And uh, one day in the next three decades, she will meet somebody. Oh, Tucker, we're going to bring him down to the, to the hood. I need you to round up some people and say, listen, we need you to be as scary as you possibly can be. You guys, I am planning on overreacting. It's not something that's going to happen spur of the moment. I'm planning on overreacting. This is the look I'm going to give when I see him for the first time. What? Sir, sir, I, was ask, I wanted to ask if I could take your 43-year-old daughter out on a date. And you think by calling me sir that somehow I'm going to think you're some great guy? Let's start with master. But how many times have you had a, 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 a time and you say to somebody, you say, hey, do you, do you, do you like your son-in-law? And a dad will say, well, you know, 
like we don't have a lot in common. And we don't like have some like great flourishing relationship, but I really love him because you should see the way he treats my daughter. And she's really happy. I'm gonna make this make sense to you. Matthew 25 says this, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer him, truly I say unto you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it for me. And we oftentimes read that scripture and we think the least of these just means the poor or the forgotten. But what if the least of these means the ones that are the hardest to love? What if the least of these are the ones that we think are least deserving of our kindness and affection or understanding? Pick the person in your life who you polar opposite think. You, you think they are off their rocker when it comes to life, relationship, politics, faith, just somebody who just, you're like, they're just hateful and nasty, and I don't want to be around them. God says, what you do unto that person is what you've done unto me. And I believe he's, he's saying something here, and I'm going to say something that sounds maybe a little bit... Um, uh, heretical here. I'm not trying to be a heretic, but I want to say this to you. What if God, like any other father or mother, is actually more concerned with how well you love his children than he is on how you love him? I mean, think about the time and effort we put into loving God. The songs, the books, the prayer, the time we invest into loving him. And he's like, I got it. It's wonderful. Thank you for loving me. But then we walk out the door and treat one of his children like a piece of trash because they're not like us. How do you, what do you think speaks louder to God? The song, the prayer, the devotion, or do you think what speaks louder to him is how you treated one of your siblings? Yeah. And we can actually rewrite John 3, 16 and totally violate the reason that we were left here on the earth. We can totally violate that and destroy and poison why God left us here. It only would make sense if when we received the knowledge of Jesus as our Lord and Savior, in that moment that he would take us to heaven, what is the point of leaving us here? Because there's a bunch of his kids that still don't know about it. When we get to heaven, the Bible talks about we'll be worshiping him 24-7 with the angels. He's not like, he's not insecure. Like, I want to have people down there and I want to have people up here both worshiping me and then I'll feel really good about how godly I am and wonderful. No, he's like, I got to leave people on the earth because I want everyone who will hear and all who are thirsty to come. And I want the knowledge of how much I love them and my children and what I've done for them and what my son came to do. I want them to find out about it. And the only way it's going to happen if my kids stay there and they're nice to one another and they represent me well and they don't get into fights and quarrels and all the stuff we get into and we actually see the kindness and love of the father be what we show. Because we can find ourselves in a situation where it becomes, for we so loved God that we alienated the world. And I don't think that you can love God and hate one of his children. I don't think it's possible. Because I believe like a natural parent would be like, I don't care how you feel about me. You better be nice to my kid. Tuck, whatever, you, whatever kind of coffee you drank this morning, I want a double <laughs> next week. I love you, Tucker. And I love, that you, I love that 25 years later, no one's figured out a way to shut you up because God keeps speaking through you to so many people and you can shout out and interrupt me anytime you want. 
because you're just a part of this message as anybody else. And the day that you're not around here, I'm hanging this thing up, okay? <laughs> but do you hear me this morning? We, 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 this church, and you're right, Tucker, we are something special and unique, and we're not patterned after a denomination or another church. We don't even go to those church building conferences because I don't want to look like anybody. I want to look like Jesus. I don't want to look like the minor family or me or my dad or anybody else. I don't want us to have anything influencing who we are except for Jesus and Jesus only. And I'm telling you, it says, for he so loved the world that he gave everything he had, the most precious thing. Now, somebody bought me a whiteboard. Where's Diane? Diana, thank you. Diana, sorry, not Diane. You can smack me later, all right? She brought me a whiteboard. Y'all ready for this? I don't know what I'm going to draw on it. I just want to draw something. Fancy people locked it down. Now, Now, I am the worst artist you will ever see. Y'all ready for this? Every one of those scriptures and every one of those references, I'm going to just kind of represent here with you, okay? So we see, we see he's the stone that the builder rejected. And we see that they ran him out of town. And they see that they rejected him. And we see that they kicked him out of the synagogue. And we see that he, he, he was hated. And he says, you're going to be hated too. And we see that they turned him over to Barabbas. And we see all of these things. And we take all of this stuff here. And we, when it happens to us, we're just, it looks like a pea. Like a pea's in a pod. I tell you I'm the worst, but that's okay. You're going to get my, word, my terrible art as often as possible. We, 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 we take these things and we go, see, it's happening to us too. We're just like Jesus. I'm just, they hate me too. I'm in good company with you, God. So we got Dan. We got Jesus. And we got Dan. And because somebody hates me, I'm comparing myself to the big JC. Or because somebody rejects me, I'm like, well, they rejected him. Yeah, one problem. Changing colors. I have like 12 colors. I'm so excited about this. There's this thing called the cross. You see, because all of this was a setup to get you to understand this. What he's saying is not, they hated me, they're going to hate you. They ran me out of town, they're going to run you out of town. Don't feel bad about it. And he's not saying, look how hard my life was. It all ties into Romans 5, 8. When he says, while they were still sinners, one of the versions I've been using lately says, while they were still rotten to the core, Christ died for them anyways. You see, all this is a setup to get to here. So when you filter it through this, then we begin to realize that it's, they hated me, but I was still willing to die for them. They ran me out of town, but I was still willing to die for them. They told me that I would, I, 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 they'd rather, they would rather save a thief and a murderer, but I was still willing to die for them. They beat me and mocked me, but I was still willing to die for them. You see, when you read all these scriptures in the context of the cross, we see the grand setup, which Jesus is saying, no matter what they do and what they say and how much they hate me and how much they reject me, I'm still willing to die for them. And I'm gonna tell you this right now, unless you're willing to die for somebody that hates you, don't compare yourself to Jesus. They hate me too. Are you going to die for the ones that hate you? Am I willing to die for the ones that hate me? No. The Bible says that it's hard to find a man who will die for a good person, let alone a bad person. This guy knew that we were wretched, that we were 
hateful, knew that we were rejected, knew that we had the wrong you know, letter on our voter registration card, knew that we drove the wrong type of vehicle, knew that me, we, we, whatever, on and on and on. He knew it all and he said, I'm still willing to die for them. As they're rejecting me, I'm taking my last breath. As they're beating me, I'm, I'm still declaring God, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They've rejected me and they've hated me, but Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know how much I love them. This should recalibrate you and I to understand that are we going to be hated at times? Yes. Some of us more than others because our mouths are bigger than others. Are we going to be rejected at times? Yes. But the story is not that we're going to be rejected or hated. The story is, what are you willing to do for the ones that hate you? What are you willing to do for the ones that reject you? What am I willing to say? What am I willing to sacrifice that they would still know how much God loves them as they were rejecting, as they're hating, as they're running me out of town? That is the message of these scriptures. It's why God put them in there, not because he was trying to get sympathy for his son. He put them in there for you and I to understand that when they were still rotten to the core, he was willing to die for them. It really is for God so loved the world. And the only way for us to emulate his love is to love our wayward siblings and his children. And he says, when you do it to the ones that deserve it the least, you've done it unto me. And the righteous man said, God, I want to do those things for you. He said, the only way to do them for me is to do them for them. I want to be there for you, God. Well, if you want to be there for me, be there for them. The greatest act of love that you and I can have towards our heavenly father is to love the least of these to be willing to sacrifice for the least of these, to look somebody in the face who's rejecting, hating, running us away, lying, manipulating, and say, hmm, they did that to him too, but he was willing to give it all. What am I willing to give? And can you and I honestly, honestly, honestly say that we spend even 10% of the energy that we should on loving people well with the understanding that they're his kids too. We are in a moment in time. I'm going to end with this. Jim, if you're here, you can play and I'll even not cover you up. There you are. We are in a moment. We are in a moment in history where people are so divided and, and full of hate and they feel totally justified in it. And I've bitten of the apple too. I'm going to tell you this right now. We need to realize that we, we are brothers and sisters. Somebody professes their faith to be Buddhist or Islam or whatever it may be. It's still a brother and sister. Somebody votes different, it's still a brother and sister. Somebody tears down your signs, it's still a brother or sister. Somebody rejects you, hates you, it's still a brother or sister. The point of all of that was to get us to the point of the cross where he said, even with all of this, Christ died for them. And then he says, if you want to love me, love them first. Love them. I love you. How beautiful would it be if we just had a revol revolution of loving one another? before we find out if somebody agrees with us. Isn't that how it works, right? We find out somebody like, wait, and you also, like me, are this? Yeah. And you went where to high school? Like me? Yes. And you live where? In the same neighborhood as me? Yes. You're just like me. I love you. 
What if it was like, wait, you have nothing in common with me? And everything you're saying right now makes zero sense to me? I love you. You hate me? I love you. You reject me? I love you. You don't think I even deserve to live? I love you. You're a rotten, despicable human being. I love you. you. Good with this this morning? Only two. I love you too. I love you too. Let's stand to our feet and pray together. We'll sing this song together. Jim's playing an old classic. You can bring this up. You can bring up the lyrics to I Love You, Lord, on the screen if you have that in the back. Oh, I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you. especially today is the sound of his children getting along and the beauty of our love for one another. Just think about this. This is not a chastisement. This is a challenge to you and me that have we grown to a place where we, we think that we're loving God really well, but when it comes time to love his children, we really struggle. And if you fit into that category, it's okay. Join the club, join the family. Can we leave here challenged this morning to see what we can do to live a little bit more like Jesus and to love the ones that least deserve it, the ones that seem to be the most difficult to get along? Can we do that as we leave this building today, be challenged with that? Maybe just start with one person, somebody that's hard, somebody that even has maybe rejected you before. Just show them some kindness and love. Sow that seed and realize that all of heaven rejoices when the kids get along. Amen. We love you guys. Thanks for hanging with us this morning. We'll be live Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, and we'll see you again next week at 10 a.m. Amen. God bless you.